Good evening, everyone. This is Keith David, and you're listening to Without Your Head. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Neil Jones, and I'm joined by Tammy Stronach, the empress of the never-ending story. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. This is a long time in the making. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, the never ending story, I always thought it's like the perfect kids movie cause it's not really childish and it, uh, promotes imagination and there's real emotion and a positive story. Just, uh, what are your opinions on the movie overall? Yeah. I mean, I, I have to agree. I think, um, what I like about the film is that, um, you can watch it as a kid, but if you end up watching it as an adult with a kid, you're not, you know, waiting for it to be over. I think, I think the really good films for, for kids, I don't know, eighties is in my head. So I'm thinking of ET and stuff like that. Um, those stories, I know that now, even with Pixar films, sometimes I'm trying to like watch a film with my daughter and she doesn't want to watch it and I'll just break and I'll end up watching it without her, which is really (laughs) strange, you know? (laughs) Like, well, she'll watch it with me next year. (laughs) Uh Has your uh, daughter seen the movie? No. um, My daughter uh, does not like scary movies. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was actually really different than her as a kid. I enjoyed horror. I enjoyed like a really um, sort of, uh, you know, big emotional journey. Um, Mm -hmm. But my daughter uh, really gets um, very scared and runs out of the room. So I'm trying to make it be a positive experience for her. Right. <laughs> uh, so I'm holding off a little bit. Well, I think we're going to do it when she's eight. Yeah. Because it is a pretty dark movie, a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is. And the, the horse dying is really sad. Yeah. The nothing is scary. The, you know, Gamora. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just... Well, I grew up watching it, and I watched it again last year when I was really sick in the hospital, and my friend Annabelle came and visited me, and we watched it together. And uh, that scene when the horse dies is still kind of makes you tear up. It's like, wow, this is really uh, hard to take. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, there's all kinds of, like, funny – I saw online some funny, like um, – people talking about how like, you know, that film, that scene totally traumatized them and they're, they're, you know, it still in therapy for it. I, I think they're exaggerating, yeah, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get involved in it? Um, so I was in an acting class in San Francisco and the casting director happened to be friends with my teacher. Mm-hmm. And she was coming by for a lunch uh, on a break from casting and saw me in the class and asked me to audition. And um, and that led to three sort of subsequent auditions. Um, and and finally, the third audition was in, was in Germany where they made the final decision. Mm-hmm. Had you been to Germany before? No, no. It was a great opportunity to travel. And I love traveling. So uh, that was definitely one of the perks. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the experience of uh, making the movie like? Um, it was, I mean, it was great. Um, I was a creature of the theater, a creature of storytelling. So it was this incredible opportunity to be inside of that. Uh, but, you know, with a, I don't even know what the budget for the, the film was. It's, you know, mm-hmm. um, so it was, it was amazing. It was sort of like waking up in a dream and, and, I was as interested in the behind the scenes stuff and in the puppets and in the sets and in the makeup. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time, um, watching as much as I could of the crew working. Mm -hmm. So were you around like the other, uh, sets and the other things being filmed? Yeah. I mean, um, the film was filmed for over a period of a year and I was only there for, uh, the summer. So certainly there was a lot of the film that I didn't see. Um, but, for the time that I was there, um, I absolutely uh, walked around and found my way into the tents where other magical landscapes were, and um, used the time between between you know when I was busy to um, to check things out. Mm-hmm. So you show a lot of emotion for a young uh, actor. How how did you get motivated to, to do the crying scene? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I mean, have you been around kids? They're so <laughs> That's emotional. True, true. <laughs> I've been to kids. So. Yeah. And I mean, my daughter, you know, I mean, she can like, you know, she like woke up in tears the other day because she was dreaming that someone took her ginger ale away from her. So, <laughs> well, I do like ginger ale. So you're I can not understand. sure like ginger ale. <laughs> I don't know. It, it didn't see. It's like it was the end of the world, right? It was like everything that I loved was going to be destroyed. I mean, it wasn't that hard. It was like that's a horrible thought. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it does. Um, Any thoughts on Wolfgang Peterson? Yeah, you know, um, I had a great time working with him. I feel like I uh, really lucked out because you can't give a good performance without a good director. It's just not possible. I mean, you can you can give a good performance, but to really um, to give a, a performance that integrates with the whole story and moves the 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 whole puzzle forward, that's really what you need a, a good director for. And so. I feel really lucky that as kids we got to work with him. He really didn't treat us like children. Mm-hmm. He treated us like professionals and like, um, you know, people who who had the intelligence and the ability to um, participate in 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 the act of storytelling. So I just. I just loved it. I mean, I think that as a kid, it's nice when adults don't dumb things down for you. You kind mm-hmm. of appreciate that. Yeah. And that comes through in the movie because, you know, it it gives kids credit that they can handle, like, emotional scenes and mm-hmm. intelligence themes. So that uh, it's all right there. And yeah, I mean, I think kids can handle a lot more than we give them credit for in a way. You know, they're, they're mm-hmm. pretty um, – I mean – I remember as a kid really having a real profound sense of, you know, what the story meant. And I read the book and I read the script and I was really in, in invested. And my, my daughter too, I mean, when we read a story together, her questions and her, you know, uh, ability to kind of think about why the story is happening. And, um, I mean, she says the most amazing things and it kind of reminds me now as an adult to not, not do that thing that adults do. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah. And it was kind of uh, ahead of its time, I think, in anti-bullying. Yes. I totally agree. I feel like that was like one of the major themes of the film. And, um, you know, in addition to being an, a performer, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm a mm-hmm. professor, and I'm a mom. And, and bullying is a really... Um, subject I feel really strongly about and I work really hard in my classrooms to um, create an environment that just you know doesn't allow for that and also um, and also with my daughter you know uh, when she's bullied how we discuss it and what it means and um, so I'm excited that that that's one of the major themes I think it's an important one and I think you know the irony is that even the most popular kid feels Mm -hmm. a little bit like an outsider because the truth is it's really hard to share our inner selves with the world and a lot of people even if they look really uh sort of in the sort of center camp or whatever they still feel like an outcast they still feel like parts of them are hard to uh hard for them to kind of communicate and so i think bastian was a really wonderful character because he kind of captured that that feeling that we all have of being outsiders sometimes. Mm -hmm. We said about even like the most popular kids in a way, you know, in a way that makes you an outsider to other kids. Cause they're like, you know, Hey, we don't want to be associated with this person because they think they're a big shot or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, half the time people are wearing masks cause they're trying to be something they think they should be. So this whole notion of, of, um, you know, uh, just being okay with with uh, being yourself, even if it's outside of the the box, is I, I think that's one of the reasons why the Neverending Story still resonates. Is you know we, mm-hmm. we probably even have that more as a culture, right? This in, it's this intense desire to kind of um, people are like you know wanting to kind of present these really polished facades of themselves and mm-hmm. and. And obviously, you can't be a, a complete human being without your flaws and and all of those things. Exactly, and I think the uh, the topic of like uh, promoting reading and imagination is uh, just as topical today, if not more. 
I totally agree. I mean, we have so many problems mm -hmm. in the world right now, and we really need as much imagination and as much goodwill and as much kind of dreaming of how to uh, move ourselves forward in a positive direction as possible. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, questions here on Facebook. Uh, Seth Chatfield wants to know um, why you took a hiatus from acting after the movie. Well, I took a hiatus from celebrity after the movie. Um, I was I was still involved in performing a lot. It's true that I did mostly dance, but also as a, a after college, I did a lot of theater in New York live. So. Um, Celebrity was really overwhelming for me as a kid. Uh, we also had um, some sort of stalking going on, which mm. was sort of terrifying for an 11 year old. Yeah. Um, and my parents are these just incredibly lovely um, archaeologists. My father's Scottish, my mother's Israeli. And the whole Hollywood celebrity world and how to navigate that, like, they were just like, we feel like we landed on planet Mars. It's like, we don't know what to tell you, Tammy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so for me, it was really more about um, giving myself the opportunity to grow up um, in a way that was grounded. And, um, and my parents really encouraged me to um, steer my own boat and row things in the direction I wanted to go. And so that really helped me in my career in New York. I was the director of my own dance company. Now I'm the director of my own theater company. And there's something really rewarding about um, being in control of the projects that you make and having a, a voice in how, how you're um, steering your life. Um, but I really, I, I love acting. I never stopped acting. I, and, and I'm excited to get back to doing more acting now in my 40s um, as my body kind of breaks down you know dancing is a short is a short career mm -hmm. um before i talk about this uh, one more question is um did this you didn't said you didn't like the celebrity and you had like stalking experiences did that affect how you uh saw the never-ending story at the time definitely i think that i just sort of like um sort of just wanted to like move on and focus on other things, you know? And so, uh, almost to a fault, if I'm super honest with myself, I think there were some, so many people who just had, you know, really lovely, genuine affection for the film. And, and I was sort of always a little bit awkward about it and trying to change the subject and like, wow, I love your tie that you're wearing, you know? <laughs> um, and so I have to say, it just feels really nice to be in a place where um, I have the I have the distance from it to celebrate it and to understand what an ex extraordinary thing it was to be a part of something that meant so much to so many people and it really um, it feels really like exciting to be able to embrace it and uh, and celebrate it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So your new uh, company is called Paper Canoe Company. Yeah, and uh, let us know what you guys are doing. Sure. It's a, a family entertainment company, and um, we're interested in telling fairy tales with a modern twist. Um, it's a little bit like starting out in the Never Ending Story, family entertainment, something that, you know, people of all ages can enjoy. Um, we started out making two live theater shows in New York, mostly because live performing is my medium. That's, I know the theaters. I have the contacts. It's the, the thing that I have the most kind of experience with. Um, but we also um, started venturing into digital content, and we uh, just released a new album called Beanstalk Jack, mm -hmm. which is a folk rock opera based on the story of Jack and the Beanstalk with a girl meets boy twist. And that's um, downloadable. We're making some music videos for that, which is really fun because it brings my choreography background together with the work I'm doing today. And um, and so I kind of, Paper Canoe is really a, a chance for me to bring all the things that I'm passionate together under one umbrella. Um, so being a mom, um, making art, telling stories, using different mediums, and, um, and being my own boss, mm -hmm. <laughs> all of those things kind of together. Mm -hmm. So uh, where will be where will people be able to see this? 
Well, we're booking shows now. We did a couple of, of shows uh, recently in Brooklyn, and um, and we're going to be booking more shows. We're developing it into um, not just a concert, but into a play concert. So we'll be adding set pieces and some costumes to it. But it's available for download right now. If you wanted oh, to hear cool. it, you can go to Bandcamp and just put in Beanstalk Jack or my name, Tammy Stronach, and it'll pop up. Mm-hmm. And then we'll have the videos um, that we're making available on our papercanoecompany.com website. Um, and that's sort of where we'll be announcing all the various upcoming theater and acting-related projects. Hmm. That's very cool. And we're going to play some of the music today um, from uh, from the Jack and the Beanstalk story. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it about Jack and the Beanstalk in particular made you want to uh, do that one first? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think it comes back to that bullying topic that you mm-hmm. brought up at the beginning. You know, um, Jack and the Beanstalk, there's this giant that kind of um, is a really big bully. And I feel like um, there's something about the little guy winning, you know, the underdog somehow succeeding against the odds, which I feel like a lot of people relate to that story, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I I like the idea that that... Jack was a dreamer and he was willing to take risks that nobody else could take. I mean, almost foolish, right? Like, why would you trade your cow for some beans? (laughs) And um, in a way, a lot of folk tales and fairy tales are these cautionary tales that um, kind of try to scare kids into just being good. (laughs) And I feel like Jack and the Beanstalk is a little different. It it sort of um, rewards the zaniness and nuttiness of just having the having just being a dreamer and and going for something kind of nuts mm-hmm. um and i think i relate to that i think that just being an artist in this world is a little bit like that so i did have a, an issue with um him stealing all the giant stuff and then killing him <laughs> right i have a six-year-old and i'm like she's always asking me she's like so what's the moral of this mom you know mm-hmm. So I was like, mm, how am I going to get this by my, my kid? Um, so we, we gave it a twist. We updated it for modern audiences. And in, in our version, uh, we gave the giant a daughter named Harmony, who um, I kind of imagine her as a cross between like Blondie, Cindy Lauper, and Madonna. You know, she lives up in this castle in the sky, and there's all this riches that the giant has looted from the land, and uh, this poor boy with a guitar on his back shows up at her door and she's been all by herself totally isolated in a gilded cage and they uh they fall in love and um he steals her heart so he doesn't he doesn't steal the giant stuff he steals her heart (laughs) and they run off together and start a band and that's always the best revenge against any bully is to uh be happy to make a corner of the world full of music and love and that's Mm -hmm. the way to do it yeah a lot of the old fairy tales are really dark. I mentioned never <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mentioned never ending story being a little dark, but these are way darker. And it's interesting, you know, like when is darkness appropriate and useful and when is it just like uh, <laughs> a technique to terrify children so they'll never stray from the path, you know? Uh, I mean, I think it, it's all in the application and the how, right? But it's it's interesting, like what what how how to make those old folk tales relevant and meaningful to us is is a fun project to explore. Mm-hmm. And uh, who makes the puppets? Oh my gosh, we have an amazing puppeteer. Her name is uh, Lake Simons. And uh, one of the great fun things about um, this company is that I have a network of artists that I've been working with uh, over the years for my dance theater work and, and, and for the theater projects that I've been making. And so all of us were really used to making work for adult shows. Mm-hmm. And um, this process of making family theater has been really nice in that we're bringing together um, artists like Lake Simons, the puppeteer, the set designer, Debo, these people who make these incredibly aesthetically sophisticated, um, in my opinion, just beautiful things and applying them to uh, shows for families. So to me, it's akin to just nourishing the soul. You want to give your kids good food. You want to expose your kids to good music. You want to give them beautiful images to see. And, you know, they deserve they deserve to um, to kind of 
be respected and, and have their aesthetic intelligence, you know, um, not underestimated. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So I guess I want to ask real quick is about, uh, I read on your IMDB page that you, uh, your family fled Persia, Iran during the revolution. Yeah. Were you, um, how old were you when that happened? And do you have any memories of that? I do. Uh, you know, memories when you're six are, um, fuzzy. I, mm-hmm. Sometimes feel like, you know, family stories kind of blend with genuine memory, and I don't really know. <laughs> I think the, the whole nature of memory is sort of so uh, elusive, but I, I do have some memories, and um, we, we lived in the British Institute in Iran. My parents were archaeologists, and uh, it was a really wonderful time to be there. It was a very dynamic place, and the Institute was very cosmopolitan. There were people from all over the world who stayed with us. So it was um, a really exciting place to grow up. And we spent a lot of times on dig sites, um, sort of in the hills with goats and relics. (laughs) Um, And um, but yes, the revolution happened in 79. And uh, we had to uh, we had to flee, you know, with a suitcase, essentially. And then uh, we bounced around. First, we were in Israel, and then we were in England. Um, and it wasn't until my father landed a job at um, UC Berkeley that we really found uh, what we considered home again, and sort of a, a place where everyone kind of fit in, and and um, and we could set down some roots. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really interesting. So you've lived a very interesting life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, Real quick, what were your favorite horror movies? You mentioned liking horror movies as a kid. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I liked, you know, Carrie. I, mm-hmm. I, I love That's Sissy Spacek in that. I thought she was kind of amazing. I like Poltergeist. I mean, didn't every kid like Poltergeist yeah. at that time? It was I awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I really like all the Alien films. I think mm-hmm. Sigourney Weaver is unbelievable and such an interesting character for a woman to play. Um, I love Stranger Things now. I can't wait I for the too. season to come out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like some European horror films too. Do you know Let the Right One In? Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah, that's I, my, I, probably, probably my favorite vampire movie. It's so good. It's mm-hmm. so good. And I'm super into vampires. <laughs> uh-huh. And the, the book is really good too. The book's even uh, darker. The movie's oh. pretty dark too, anyway, but yeah. Uh, and those great. kids, talk about kid actors that mm. deliver incredible performances. Definitely. And yeah. the, uh, I like the American remake, but it's basically just the same movie again. Uh, you know, I'm actually, I haven't even seen the American remake. I've only seen the Swedish one, which mm-hmm. was just the image versus, wow. I think something about Swedish film is really fascinating. The way they, the, the landscapes are so cold and lonely. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it definitely sets up the whole feel of the movie. Mm-hmm. It definitely has uh, a cold vibe throughout the whole movie, and everything seems kind of doomed. Yeah, uh, you know, so. yeah, and I just love that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very, it's it's not a feel good movie. But. No, no. <laughs> uh, there's some bullying in that too. Yeah, there is. You're mm-hmm. right. It's a lot of similar themes. Exactly. So uh, it's been great talking to you. You too. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to connect. And I want to say thank you to all the people out there who still have um, affection and interest in The NeverEnding Story. I'm really grateful and and uh, good luck to everyone. Thanks. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this. Not just because you're here, but I really, uh, it sounds fun to me. Sounds good. Okay. Take care. Bye, Neil. Thanks. Bye. How are you doing? This is Lance Hendrickson, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. <laughs>